We should pray. Hallelujah, God. You reign. As we are thrust into turmoil, as we question what is going on, as we look at our city broken and shambles, hallelujah, God, you reign. As we see the innocent slaughtered, as we see a culture that hates you, as we see people given to violence, as racial tension reaches an apex, as our political system is broken and divides us, hallelujah, God, you reign. We pray this morning that you would comfort us from your word, that you would encourage us in your word. We pray for your spirit to take this word and apply it to our hearts, to change us and to make us into the church that you want us to be. And we trust you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the other day when I wrote these sermon notes and titled this thing, When All Sorrow is Turned to Joy, I could have had no idea of what would happen Sunday morning. So I make a lot of statements in this sermon about God reigning, about us looking forward to a future when God returns to us in victory, about God's love for us, and about how that empowers us to live holy lives, satisfied in Jesus Christ in the here and in the now. And that has not changed with the circumstances of this morning. God still reigns. He still is coming back. And we still long for him. And we are still motivated by that return. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to ask you a question this morning as we begin. Why in the world are you here? You worked hard all week long. You drove kids around from point A to point B and some of you to point C and D after that. You sat in meetings all week. You pulled over 40 hours at your job. You walked the dog. You cut the grass. You spent your entire week going and going and going and going. Why on earth are you here this morning? What in the world can prompt you to leave your house and to come sit and listen to me talk? Carlton thinks that's a bad choice. (laughs) Sorry, I heard a chuckle. I had to pick on it. I would venture to say that there are probably two real answers to this question. You can give lots of answers, but they really fall into two different categories. The first is that you have prioritized communing with God and getting to know God's people. You've prioritized coming together to kindle your affections for the love of the God of the universe, to worship him through singing, to worship him through the word, and to worship him with his people. You've come to be encouraged and equipped by the teaching of his word and to join together so that communally we are built up and we are challenged and prompted to be the church that the Lord Jesus wants us to be. Or, we're here going through the motions. We're here because this is where we were last week and the week before that. Or we're here because maybe we missed last Sunday and people start asking questions we don't want to answer if we miss too many weeks in a row. Or maybe we're here to ship our kids over to the professionals in the children's ministry wing so that they can disciple them and create in them a love for Jesus. Maybe we're here to hear a clever sermon. Joke's on you. Uh, (laughs) Maybe we're here to gain knowledge from our textbook and have our heads swell up meanwhile our hearts remain untouched. I want us to examine our motives this morning. Why are we here? We're either here for the right reasons or we're here for the wrong reasons. 
We've either come expecting and for the purpose of pouring our hearts out in worship of God through singing and through prayer and through the study of his word, or we're here because this is the form of religion that we've chosen to follow, and we're checking off boxes. It breaks my heart to confess that there are many Sundays that I come here and I'm not pumped up about worshiping God. I'm not excited to encounter God in his word. I'm tired, and it feels heavy. But I'd venture to say that I'm probably not alone in that. If I had to guess, I would say that many of us on occasion simply slap the alarm clock, we jump in the shower, we get dressed, we down a cup of coffee or seven on the way in, we say some how you doings, we scream some hallelujahs during the worship music, We open our Bibles, we maybe even fill in the blanks in our notes, and all the while our hearts are far from God. God's word does not penetrate. We never truly worship. But there's good news. I think God speaks to people like me and people like you in our passage we're going to look at this morning in the book of Zechariah. So turn there with me if you would. Zechariah chapter 7. We will look at chapters 7 and 8 today, continuing our series through the Minor Prophets. In Zechariah chapter 7, nearly two years have passed since the uh, eight night visions that we looked at in previous weeks, and I'm grateful to Pastor Steve and to God himself for not giving me those passages and for allowing me to talk about this one. It's quite a bit simpler. The work of the temple at this point in Israel's history was coming along quite well, the work of rebuilding the temple. And in fact, it's going to be completed in just another two years. The exiles who've returned appear to be setting a course of obedience to Yahweh. Their trajectory looks good. There's great promise awaiting Israel. But old habits of hypocrisy and ritualistic legalism begin to seep their way into Israel's religion once again. And God confronts in this passage their legalism with a message to Zechariah. In this message, the Lord is going to point the people in two different directions. He's going to point them first backwards to their former times of disobedience and to their judgment that they endured because of that. And then he's going to point them forwards to a time of great promise when God himself is going to come and dwell with his people. And both of these realities are supposed to weigh on the Israelites in the here and now and prompt them to live obedient and holy lives and having hearts that are kindled towards the Lord. All right? Likewise, this passage does the same thing for us. Yes, it was intended to and written to specifically Israel, but we are a people susceptible to the same kind of sin. And we are a people who serve the same God. And we are a people who oftentimes engage in outwardly religious acts without ever engaging our hearts. And this morning, this text points us backwards to Israel and their former disobedience and the judgment of God that awaited them and that came upon them and points us forward to the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns for his bride. And those two realities prompt us in the here and now to live holy lives and to have our hearts kindled, our affections stoked for God himself. So let's jump in. Zechariah chapter 7 verse 1. In the fourth year... Of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, which is Kislev. Now the people of Bethel had sent Sherezer and Regimelech and their men to entreat the favor of the Lord, saying to the priests of the house of the Lord of hosts and to the prophets, Should I weep and abstain in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? First thing we're going to see here in this text is a question about fasting. The year is 518. A group was sent from Bethel to ask a question of the prophets and priests in the temple. And the question is, do we need to keep observing this feast that we have been observing for 70 years? They were observing a feast in the uh, the fourth month. Uh, I'm sorry, the fourth day. uh, Yeah, I'm sorry, (laughs) in the fourth month. And this feast was to recognize and remember the fall of the Jerusalem temple, right? Uh, And so the question is understandable. Given recent circumstances, given the progress that Israel has made, should they continue to observe this fast? Should they continue to abstain from food during this time? So their question sounds entirely reasonable to us, but 
what they didn't expect is that they're going to get an answer that provides a window into their heart. You know you have that, that friend or that family member that if you have kind of a yes or no question, they're not the ones you ask, right? Because you know you're going to have to wait 45 minutes for the explanation and everything that comes with it. Well, that's kind of what uh, happens here. So the contingency from Bethel comes, and Zechariah gives them two chapters worth of an answer. So they ask a simple question, they get a sermon instead. So they had asked about fasting, and they're given an answer that exposes the heart that's there in your notes. An answer that exposes the heart. Look with me at verse 4. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me. Say to all the people of the land and to the priests, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh for these 70 years, was it for me that you fasted? And here this rhetorical question from God reveals that they fast, but it is not in true repentance. Was it for me that you fasted? God asks. Well, first of all, God never commanded them to follow this fast. God never asked them to commemorate the fall of Jerusalem. There was only one fast commanded in the Old Testament. That is the Day of Atonement, right? Yom Kippur. They're commanded with this one thing. So from the outset, this is a man-made ritual that they are following. Okay? Second, fasts in the Old Testament were intended to communicate something very, very specific. They were to display an attitude of mourning, of repentance, and of hope for God's presence in the future. So it sounds like this. In other words, if you're fasting, you are communicating this to God. God, I know we have sinned against you. We weep over our sin. We turn away from our sin. We long for your presence to return to us again. No doubt this fast of the fifth month had begun a genuine or had begun as a genuine expression of broken hearts over their sin but they have now slipped into religious observance it's not a fast anymore now it's just kind of a diet right you can see this in the question itself should i weep and abstain as we have for these many years note the exasperation in their voice god this is hard on us this is really bumming us out now, you haven't returned to us yet, necessarily. The, the temple's not totally rebuilt yet, but God, can we, can we stop now? Can we end this now? And God says, you were never doing it for me in the first place. Your hearts were never inclined towards me in this fast anyway. Lest one object, God asked them a follow-up question, revealing that not only do they fast not in repentance... But when they rejoice, they do not rejoice in God's deliverance. Look at verse 6 in chapter 7. And when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Contrasted with the language of abstaining, which is the language of fasting, eating and drinking are the, is the language of feasting and of celebration. Right? There were lots of feasts that, Israelites, that the Israelites were supposed to commemorate God's deliverance. So God poses a question to help them better answer the first one, right? Did you ever fast for me? Hmm. I don't know, God. Maybe I did. Well, well, then let's test it like this. When you feast, is it for me? When you eat and drink, are you doing it in remembrance of what I've done for you? The question is phrased in a very specific way so that you know the answer that God is expecting. Look back at it. And when you eat and when you drink, do you not or don't you eat for yourselves? Don't you drink for yourselves? God expects them to answer, yes, God, we eat for ourselves. And yes, God, we drink for ourselves. We are not acknowledging you through our, fe through our feasts. Neither are they acknowledging him through their fasts. Okay, well, well one more test. Maybe, maybe they just kind of got those things a little bit wrong, and maybe there's something uh, else, something that can redeem them. Let's look at verse 7. Another question. Were not these the words that the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous, prosperous with her cities around her, and the south and the lowland were inhabited? Israel, you're curious whether your fasts have been for me? You're curious whether your feasts have been for me? Well, how about this question? Haven't your prophets told you all along that you follow mere religious observance? Meanwhile, your heart is far from me. Hasn't that been what the former prophets have said since the beginning? So with this, God points out that they heard, but they didn't listen to God's prophets. And their ignoring of the message of the former prophets makes painfully clear that their religious activity is entirely in vain. 
If it hadn't been in vain, they would be obeying God's words and God's commands through the prophets, right? But they aren't. God's asking, didn't you hear the prophets? And look what these prophets have told him. Verses 8 through 9 are told the people. And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the poor and let no, uh, I'm sorry, do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. And let no one of you devise evil against another in your heart. Well, let's see, Israel, you want to know if your fasts are genuine? We want to know if your feasts are genuine? We want to know if you've paid attention to the prophets in the former days? What does your life look like? Have you rendered true judgments? The Hebrew word there sort of carries this idea of a proper ordering of society. Have you ordered your society properly in the eyes of God? What about showing kindness to people? This is the word for uh, covenant faithful love, right? How about that? Have you shown this sort of covenant faithfulness to each other and to God? How about mercy? And that word uh, brings, uh, carries a connotation of sort of this maternal tender kind of love, right? Have you loved one another like a mother loves a child? What about those who are weak, those who have the fewest legal rights? How do you treat them? Have you treated them well? Have you oppressed the widow? Have you oppressed the orphan? What about the foreigner in your land? How do you treat them? Do you devise evil against one another? Do you have a vindictive spirit that hates your brother? Are you setting others up for a fall? And now... With this, their behavior stands as a witness against them. Unsure of where your heart is, Israel? Not sure if your worship is genuine? Not sure if your religious activity stems from the heart? What does your life look like? And with those words, the contingency from Bethel, and yes, the entire nation stood condemned before the God of the universe. And I wonder this morning, how do we fare? Yes, this text was written specifically to Israel. But when we worship and look to this God, how do we fare in light of his word? When we compare our life to this rubric, true judgments, kindness and mercy, oppressing the weak, devising evil. How do we add up or how do we measure up? I think if we're honest, we know we fall short. We fall so incredibly short of this on an hourly basis. And so the question now becomes, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond to God's word? When we look at this and realize that we fall so incredibly short of God's ideal and purpose for us, what are we to do? In this passage, the Lord explains how the Israelites pre-exile responded. And listen to the vivid picture that, that he provides here in this text. The response of a hypocritical heart. Look at verse 11. But they refused to pay attention. They turned a stubborn shoulder, and they stopped their ears that they might not hear. They made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words of the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. First of all, they refused to pay attention. That's there in your notes. They stubbornly and willfully chose to distract themselves away from what God was saying. God came to them with a word, and they looked away. They turned their back. They wanted nothing of it. They refused to hear what God had to say. Not only did they refuse to hear what God had to say, but they turned a stubborn shoulder. This language is used in the Old Testament uh, and in other Hebrew literature of an ox who jerks his shoulder away from his master when his master tries to place the yoke on him. The picture is this. Israel has turned away. They're walking away from God. God reaches out to grab the shoulder, and he jerks their arm away, or they jerk their arm away from God. They refused to pay attention. They turned a stubborn shoulder, and next they plugged their ears. Literally, this, the idiom is they made their ears heavy. I have no clue what that means. But the point is that they stopped up their ears so they couldn't hear. So not only had they now turned away from God, not only had they jerked their arm away as God reached out to them, now they stuck their fingers in their ears so they cannot hear what God is saying. And lest something seep in by accident and make it into them... Lest his words creep in where we don't want them, they harden their hearts. The translation here is difficult because nobody really knows what kind of stone or rock the text is talking about. But I like what the ESV says. They made their hearts diamond hard. 
And I like that because the point is not that their heart was literally as hard as some particular rock or stone or sediment. The idea is that their hearts are hard as they could possibly be. There is no way that the word of God is going to penetrate this, get into this. And so they endured the wrath of God. Verse 12, second half through verse 14. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. As I called, and they would not hear, so they called, and I would not hear, says the Lord of hosts. And I scattered them with a whirlwind among the nations that they had not known. All the nations, I'm sorry, all the nations that they had not known. Thus the land was left desolate, so that no one went to and fro, and the pleasant land was made desolate. So we've taken this text, and we've kind of pulled it apart. Let's put it all back together real quick. Formerly, the people went through the motions, right? They offered sacrifices. They observed feasts and fasts. All the while, their hearts were, hard from, or were far from God, evidenced by the fact that they did not render true judgments. They did not uh, show mercy and kindness to one another. They oppressed the weak, and they had a vindictive spirit against brother and sister. And as God approached them to sort of call them back from this way that they were going, they jerked away. They wouldn't listen. They didn't want to pay attention. And so they were scattered to foreign lands, and the promised land was left desolate. What a reminder to all those who heard this word in Zechariah's day. You ask about fasting, well, your hearts are far from God. That's how you got into this mess in the first place. Think about it. If you're the contingency from Bethel and you go to the temple and you want to ask a few questions uh, about the fast that you've been keeping up and you're pointed to the fact that God has destroyed you because your heart, what do you have to look around at as a landscape? You have a ruined temple. You have a city that is a mere shell of what it used to be. You have shambles and rubble all around you. And the prophet stands before them and says, how can you fall into this same kind of sin? Don't you know that this is what got you here in the first place? Don't you know that this hardness of heart is what led to this destruction that you see? You see this this temple being worked on? You see the piles of rubble outside? You see the, the city that is not what it once was and not what God has promised it would be? Don't you know that your heart caused that? It's interesting we don't get to hear from this passage how these people respond. Perhaps the text is is missing this because it wants us to ponder how we should respond to this. As we hear this word this morning, how do we respond? When our motives in worship are are questioned, as we are confronted with the fact that there are times that we, we simply go through the motions. We want nothing to really do with God. Our hearts are hard. We want nothing to do with him. We don't want to worship him, but we're going to keep going through the motions to keep up an outward appearance. All the while, we oppress the weak. We devise evil against one another. We do not show compassion and mercy and faithfulness either to one another or to God. Are we going to tune his word out in favor of the distractions? There are plenty of them. Are we going to be like an ox that dodges the yoke? Will we cover our ears and harden our hearts and build a wall around ourselves so that the word of God can't penetrate because we don't have time to bother with what the God of the universe wants from us? If so, we see from this example in God's word that God's judgment awaits. His anger burns against those who spurn his goodness and his grace. God is a loving God. God is a merciful God. God is a just God. And his wrath will come upon those who do not take, who, who take him lightly. But for those who feel that this word has penetrated your heart, for those who hear this word and embrace it, for those who gladly submit to the correction of our Lord, and take heed to the words that he speaks, we see that what awaits for us is not judgment, but a promise of the coming Lord, a promise of God's presence. Look at chapter 8, read verses 1 through 3 with me. And the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I'm jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I'm jealous for her with great wrath. 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord, the holy mountain. Notice a zeal for his people prompts a return to his people. The Lord is coming to dwell among his people and this is going to change everything in this text. This is the decisive act, the decisive action that changes from chapter 7 to chapter 8. God comes and dwells with his people. He's like a stone dropped in a pool of water and the waves ripple out from the center. Probably a, probably a better description of that is a meteor that comes down and collides with the earth and waves of grace and judgment spread out from the center, consuming everyone around. The Lord's presence is going to result first in holiness among his people. Verse 3, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion and will dwell in her midst. And Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. The presence of the Lord results in a new nickname for Jerusalem. And you read that and you say, so what? Who cares? Why do we care about a new nickname for Jerusalem? It's a big deal. Listen to this. Look at the note or the, uh, the quote there in your notes from John MacArthur. You know the names for Jerusalem in the Bible aren't very complimentary. Did you know that in Lamentations 1, Jerusalem is called the unclean city? Did you know that in Isaiah 121, Jerusalem is called a harlot and a murderer? Did you know that in Revelation 11, Jerusalem is called Sodom and Egypt? But there's coming a day when Jerusalem will be called a city of truth. And do you know why? Because the God of truth will reside there. God's presence in this city changes everything. And so the Lord's presence results in holiness among his people and generations of undisturbed peace. Take a look at verses 4 through 5 with me. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand and because of, because of great age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. Now, people like to come to this verse and draw all sorts of uh, conclusions about what our you know, bodies are going to be like in the millennium or what, you know, how, how old we're going to grow and that kind of stuff. But, and we can sp speculate about all of that stuff. But that's not the point of the text. The point of the text is that from young to old, they will enjoy peace because God is there. God comes, God reigns, God reigns and provides peace for all of his people. The point is that these generations, will no longer will the men be taken away from, by war. No longer will women and children be taken away by raiding armies in Israel. There will be peace, and thus the people will be safe. No more will people stay inside for fear. Now it's safe to go out into the streets. Our kids will be even playing in the streets. Now, we need to be careful how we apply this verse. This is not what you would pick as the theme verse for children's ministry. Okay? The idea is that things are so safe that kids are free to, to wander about and play in the street because we don't have to worry about someone coming and harming them. Those from Bethel are listening in at this point, and they're looking around and thinking, are you sure, God? Like, are you sure? We've never known a time like this before. This isn't just mere restoration to what we used to be. We haven't known this kind of blessing. We haven't known this kind of peace as a nation before. God's answer comes in verse 6. Thus says the Lord of hosts, If it is marvelous in the sight of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts? What he's asking is this. Just because it seems hard to you, do you think that it must seem hard to me? Just because you can't imagine a way of how you could make this happen, do you think that means that God can't figure out a way to make it happen? It's marvelous to you. <laughs> Am I supposed to marvel at it? I can easily do this. God says, just because it seems impossible to you does not mean it's impossible to me. I can accomplish it. And not only will there be holiness among my people, not only will there be generations of undisturbed peace, but there will be a regathering of God's people. Verses 7 through 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. Now it's interesting here in this text that those who have come in and taken the people of God are referred to as the East Country and the West Country. And if you're familiar with, with some geography, to the west of Israel is water, and to the east is a desert. So 
that's not where they were taken. Typically, those who were their captors were, in, were referred to as the north. So why would they refer to them like this? Well, here's the point. It doesn't matter where Israel is dispersed to. It doesn't matter where the people of God have ended up. From west to east, God is going to call them back to himself. There is not a place on earth where God's effective grace cannot and will not find them. In the face of such a promise, how could the people respond? What can they say to these great promises from God? Well, like I said earlier, we don't see it in these verses, but we do have several uh, messages from the Lord regarding a response in the verses that follow. There are three commands and then two results of this time of restoration that Israel is going to enjoy. Each one is introduced with the familiar adage, uh, thus says the Lord of hosts. And so from these, I've summarized uh, what I think are five applications, that as we consider our hearts, as we consider the fact that we are often far from God, as we consider the fact that we often uh, do not truly engage God in worship, even when we're doing the outward forms, five applications for a people like us. This is the response of a captivated heart. This is a heart who has heard the warnings and heard the promises of God and who has been inclined towards God and who is captivated by God and who is in awe of his almighty power and plan. First application, let our resolve be strengthened for the Lord will bless. Let our resolve be strengthened for the Lord will bless. Verses 9 through 12, thus says the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, you who in these days have been hearing these words from the mouth of the prophets who were present on the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that that the temple might be built. For before those days there was no wage um, for man or any wage for beast, neither was there any safety from the foe for him who went out or him who came in. For I set every man against his neighbor. But now I will not deal with the remnant of this people as in the former days, declares the Lord. For there shall be a sowing of peace. The vine shall give its fruit, and the ground shall give its produce, and the heavens shall give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. Zechariah begins with a familiar command, especially to those who are charged to to rebuild the temple, right? Let your hands be strengthened. Don't be dismayed. Don't be dismayed. Let your hands be strong. Why? Because God's blessing is coming just on the other side. There was a time when the endeavors of the people were not producing any fruit. There was a time when all of their toil and all of their work and all of their effort resulted in nothing but frustration. But God says, I'm not going to deal with you like that anymore, Israel. I'm going to bless you now. The fruit of the the ground is going to give up its fruit and give up its produce. And the heaven is going to give up its dew. And you're going to enjoy a time of massive blessing. What's more, verse 13, check this out. As I called and they would not hear. I'm sorry, that's chapter 7. You don't want to hear that one again. And as you have been a byword of cursing among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. No more are they going to be cursed. They will now be blessed and they will be a blessing to the nations around them. And in the same way the Lord has made them a byword, he will now bless them. How relevant is this for us today? Those of us who sit in this room, guilty of approaching God in the same legalistic manner at times, with this irreverent kind of lightheartedness, those who really don't take God very seriously, those who on occasion are simply going through the motions on Sunday morning, hear the word of the Lord here. For all those who are God's, great blessing awaits. There's coming a time when the Lord will be with us, And all bad things, like cops being shot on airline highway, will be done away with. Racial tension in our cities, they'll be gone. A political system that promotes division down the middle and hatred each for the other side will be done away with. Because we'll have one king and one ruler and he will bring peace. And his message to us today is do not be dismayed. for This time of blessing is coming. That's what we wait for. So let us live without fear, for God's purpose is going to stand. Verses 14 and 15. For thus says the Lord of hosts, as I purposed to bring disaster to you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, and I did not relent, says the Lord of hosts, so again have I purposed in these days to bring good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Fear not. 
the destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity of God's people came against them in the former days because God himself had purposed to bring calamity upon them. And God says, just like I purposed it then, and you know my purpose stands, now I'm purposing to bless you, and you know that my purpose still stands. What a beautiful promise to those of us in this room. Let me, let me jump to the New Testament real quick. I'm just going to read uh, Ephesians chapter 1. You wonder this morning uh, what kind of blessing can this, uh, what kind of promise this can be for us? What has God uh, purposed in his heart for all of those who are in Christ? Check this out. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved, that is in Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who are the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory glory. Church, do you wonder what God's purpose is for you? Do you wonder what will stand for us who are found in Christ? Thus the Lord tells the people through Zechariah, don't fear. His purpose stands. Even in times like today, his purpose stands. So let us love peace and truth, that's the next application, for our sorrow will turn to joy. Verses 18 through 19. And the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth month, and the fast of the seventh month, and the fast of the tenth month, shall be to the house of Judah seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love truth and peace. Here we find out that they didn't have not one, not two, but four different fasts that they were keeping in commemoration of the fall of Jerusalem. I think you can read about those in 2 Kings 25. They, uh, four different events. And so their yearly calendar was filled up with four different events that they were meant to just mourn, to fast, to repent. And now here in this text, they're asking, do we have to? Do we have to do that, God? Do we have to keep doing it? It's such a bummer. The Lord points them to the time when they will no longer mourn. Instead, they're going to rejoice. When the Lord comes to dwell with his people forever, there will be no more mourning. There will be no more sadness. There will be no more tears. Instead of fasting in those days, they will feast because God himself will be with them. And thus, here's the application for us. Love, peace, and truth. I devoted a lot of time this week trying to figure out what's the connection between peace and truth, loving peace and truth, and our sorrow turning to joy. The text doesn't make it explicit what the little therefore in verse 19 is there for. It doesn't really tell us, and so I've thought a lot about it, and I think this is my best understanding. The idea is that somehow... Our current circumstances prompt us not to love peace and truth. But Jesus on the horizon does. That's what it calls us to. So the idea is that we as Christians, with great hope, they as Israelites, with great hope, look forward to God's coming promise, and they can rise above the circumstances of daily life that keep them from loving peace and truth, and they can love it. Because they know that God is coming to set all things right. Oh, and it's interesting. These, these words I'm about to read, I, I wrote them before I ever knew what happened this morning. And so, um, here it is. 
So then I wondered, is there anything about our current scenario that tempts us not to love peace and truth? How about a political system that specializes in splitting people down party lines, demonizing everything from the other side? Oh, you're a Republican? Well, you hate gay people and poor people. Oh, you're a Democrat? Well, you hate America and religion and babies. Does that sound familiar? How about racial tension in our city? Two sides at war with one another, neither one hearing what the other side has to say. These issues flare up in our society, and it's like something takes over us. We lose our minds. Rather than examine the issues closely, we want to just flatten them out and jump to one side and hurl insults at the other. We want to argue against caricatures, never really engaging substance or one another. Yeah, current circumstances tempt us not to love peace and not to love truth. But the coming of our Lord just out on the horizon speaks into our lives and it promises hope. Thus, we don't need to get caught up in the mess that goes on around us. We can pursue peace with all people. We can pursue truth no matter if it fits into the boundaries of a particular ideology that we have chosen to follow. Why? Because Jesus. That's why. We don't have to look to world systems to fix what's broken here on this earth. As a matter of fact, we know as believers that no world system will ever fix what is wrong with us. What is broken in us is us. It's our hearts. And the only thing that changes that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the only thing that's going to set things straight is Jesus coming back one day. And that is what we long for with eager anticipation. Not the right running mate for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. Not the right movement to come along and fix race relations. That is not what we need. What we need is the gospel, and that is our responsibility as the church. We are armed. We are equipped with the word of God. We have the gospel, and so we go out into our city, and we shine the light of the gospel in the dark places. That brings us perfectly to our next Our next application here, let us shine the light of God's favor for the times are dark. Catch the reversal here from what happened in chapter 7. Look at verses 20 through 22 in chapter 8. Thus the Lord of hosts, peoples, uh, thus says the Lord of hosts, peoples shall gather, shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. In chapter 7, a contingency came from Bethel to ask a question about a fast. In chapter 8, people are again coming to Jerusalem not to ask questions about a fast, not to ask questions about religious ritual. Why are they coming? They're coming because God is there. This has been made obvious by the holiness of the people. We've already seen that. The great peace that they are enjoying. The regathering of God's people. Jerusalem shines the light of God's favor and God's presence. And people flock to her. How relevant for us, church. How relevant for us. Listen to the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. I know lots of people... uh, don't like to apply this to the current age or whatever, but I think this is very fitting and apropos for where we are. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Church, you are the light of the world. Our world is dark and it is broken and it right now more than ever needs to see the church being the church, shining the light of the gospel in the dark places. Amen? Amen. The final application. Let us cling to the Jew for surely he is God with us. You may ask, how did you get there? Well, let's look at verse 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, ten men from the nations of every tongue shall hold the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. 
Now, this verse points to a time of restoration for God's people, and it depicts nations rushing up to a Jew and sort of grabbing hold to his rope, saying, take us to God, take us to God, take us with you. Let us go to Jerusalem and be with God with you. We live in a time where Israel is not fulfilling this. We live in a time where Israel is far from this, in fact. And so how do we apply this to our lives? Well, one, we can pray for Israel. We can pray for their future, uh, that they will turn to the Lord. But I think we can take a step back away from the specifics and look at the concept behind this text. The idea here is that many cling to the Jew who they believe can usher them into God's presence. Let us go with you. For we've heard that God is with you, brothers and sisters. Though Israel is not at this point able to usher nations into the presence of God, we may look to the true Israel who succeeded where the nation has failed. He has always been the one, the only one, able to serve as the mediator between God and man. The one who is able to usher us directly into the presence of God in the very holy of holies. The one through whom we have great confidence as we draw near to our God. Our great God and King, Jesus Christ, who has always been faithful to his mission and to us. Let's cling to him, because he is on this very day God with us. Let's cling to him, because we know that in this broken world, we have nothing else. What are we going to hold on to? We're going to hold on to our riches? We're going to hold on to our stuff? We're going to hold on to our life? We see how quickly that can be taken from us. But Jesus cannot. Nobody can pry that out of our hands. Nobody can pry us out of his hand. And I want to ask you today, do you know him? Have you grabbed onto the robe of the one who has come and borne sin and guilt on his shoulders? The one who committed no sin but took your sin so that you may have his righteousness? It's a very simple message got to explain it to my daughter this week. She's been doing different things, and she'll scream at us, or she'll hit someone, or she'll yank a toy away, and she'll look at us with disappointment in her eyes and say, sorry. Now, she's got this thing where she sits in her high chair, and when she cleans her little plate there, she, uh, instead of saying, more food, please, she screams at the top of her lungs, and it's blood curdling. It's horrible. If you've ever heard her do it, if you haven't, come over for lunch. You'll hear it. Um, <laughs> But yesterday, she looked at me and she, she screamed. And I, we've always been very gentle. We've been very careful never to call her bad or tell her she's bad or anything like that. And she pointed to herself. She said, I'm bad. I'm bad. Bad. So I had the chance to say, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you are bad. But you know Jesus, you know about Jesus. And Jesus took your bad so that you can have his good. That's the simple gospel for us. That's the gospel to our city. Jesus took our bad so that we can have his good. If we trust him. As he hung on the cross, he bore the wrath of God on our behalf. And all those who trust him are forgiven their debts, and they are tucked away in Christ. Will you cling to him today? If you're not a believer, you see the anger of God kindled against those who take God and reduce him, who don't approach him with reverence. We see the reality of God's judgment. Will you cling to him today? Church, will we cling to him? Will we allow him to transform us from the inside out? From the awful sin of outward religious activity that's devoid of any affections for the Lord, will we allow him to take that from us and to make us new people? Confronted with the brokenness of our hearts and our propensity to simply go through the religious motions, will will we refuse to be satisfied by anything except Christ alone? When the things of this world compete with our, with our Lord and Savior with, for our affections and our devotion and our time and our resources and our children, will we refuse to be satisfied with anything else? Will we cling to the robe of Christ alone? 
If you'd like to know more about how to trust Jesus, during the last song we're about to play here in just a minute, I'd love to show you from the scriptures of how you can have a relationship with him and how he can take your bad and he will give you his good if you will trust in him and join yourself to him. So church this week, as we, as we leave here with heavy hearts today, may we remember these five things. Let our resolve be strengthened for the Lord will bless. Let us live without fear for God's purpose is gonna stand no matter what happens in our city and in our nation. Let us love peace and truth for our sorrow will turn to joy one day. Let us shine the light of God's favor of the gospel in the dark times of our world and let us cling to Jesus for surely he is God with us. Let's pray. God, if we are not humbled by this word, by the message through Zechariah the prophet, if that doesn't do something to us, it's not because there's a problem with your word. It's because we, like Israel, often turn a stubborn shoulder. We refuse to pay attention. We make our ears heavy so that we can't hear the message. We make our hearts hard so that nothing can penetrate. We put a wall around ourselves. God, free us from that. And I pray as we, as we sing these, this next song, I pray that our hearts would be softened, that our worship of you would be truly awakened within us. Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for the brokenness that exists. We pray for our city. God, help us as the church to shine the light of the gospel. Help us to see that our only hope is in Jesus Christ and nothing else that this world offers. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.